Hollywood Light Sides. Comedians of the Golden Age. Most people only know comedians as we see them on the screen. Then there are those quote unquote biopics that blend fiction with fact. We're never sure how much they tell us is true. I'm more interested in their amusing personal quirks. Things that make us like them even more. This is a party with 20 funny men and women as our guests of honor. Abbott and Costello. This dynamic duo was extremely successful in their run and still very well remembered today. They conquered live performances, movies, radio, and television. Abbott and Costello was also heavily imitated in all forms of media. The idea of the tall, skinny straight man and the short, fat, funny man became an instant formula for comedy. However, it wasn't always Abbott and Costello. Before that, it was Williams and Costello. Lou Costello's earlier partner was Al Williams. The partnership was short-lived, but not because of any professional reasons. Williams died of a heart attack after performing only a few shows with Costello. Bud Abbott then became his partner and history was made. Would Williams and Costello have ever made it as big as Abbott and Costello? We'll never know. When Abbott and Costello started doing radio appearances, a problem was identified. Their natural speaking voices were both very similar. If you saw them live, there would be no confusion. But when you're just hearing them, you could get confused with who was saying what. A producer told the team that one of them had to change their voices. It was decided that Costello would go with a higher pitch, which became his trademark. Hey, Abbott! What's interesting is that, even out of character, Costello's voice took on the higher pitch. Abbott's voice over the years became quite raspy. Abbott and Costello were instant hits in Hollywood, despite the fact that their first film was a flop. How does this make sense? They were hired not as the stars, but as supporting actors for the 1940 film One Night in the Tropics. They weren't meant to have that big of a role in the movie, but they had so much good material that lines of the other cast members were cut so it could still fit within the 90 minute time frame. One Night in the Tropics belly flopped but the standouts for everyone watching were Abbott and Costello. Universal, the studio that made the flop, put Abbott and Costello in their own films after that and had a very successful series on their hands. Altogether, the pair made 36 movies. Ben Turpin Old-time comedians and pie-throwing go hand-in-hand. Hand. A lot of people associate the Three Stooges with the fine art of pie-throwing. However, they were far from the first comedians to do it. Ben Turpin was a major comedy star during the silent film era. He did a lot of aggressively physical comedy, but he is best known for his cross-eyed appearance. Ben did do a number of small but memorable parts in sound films that are worth watching. He really knew how to deliver a line. The pie in the face gag was his thing, and he got hit with a lot of them. In later years, he confessed that he didn't eat pies, he hated them. He was hit with so many pies in his life that the things haunted him. But one thing that a lot of people want to know is, was Ben Turpin really cross-eyed? His right eye was. Ben's left eye was actually normal, but he intentionally crossed it for comedic effect. Don't feel bad for him. That cross-eyed look got him rich and famous, and he lived very comfortable for the rest of his life due to real estate investments he made with his movie money. Talk about making a weakness into a strength. The Three Stooges. The Pie Guys. Okay, I brought them up. I've got no one else to blame. Everyone should know the Three Stooges. If you don't, shame on you. As they have stood for decades, the Three Stooges are probably the best known old time comedy act. They did throw pies. Not all the time, but it was memorable when they did. Believe it or not, Moe, the leader, was the chief pie thrower in every scene where the pie was thrown off screen at someone. He actually had very good aim and could hit someone with a pie exactly where he wanted it to go. 
Mo Howard was probably the best pie thrower in the movie business. Larry Fine had a fine wife. Before Larry joined up with the Three Stooges, he was part of a vaudeville act with the Haney sisters. One was named Loretta, the other was Mabel. Larry married Mabel. The attractive sisters sang songs and Larry played the violin. Of course they had to do some funny routines. And since sex has always sold, the sisters would wear some interesting outfits from time to time. Mabel did jazz dancing, where Loretta did classical dancing. The Fines had a long, successful marriage. 1928 was an eventful year for them. Larry joined up with the Stooges. Mabel gave birth to their daughter, Phyllis, and retired from show business to stay home and take care of her. Curly Howard loved dogs. Curly collected dogs, like some people collect baseball cards. He would find stray dogs and shelter them until they found homes. Of course, he kept some of them, too. Curly probably saved more than 5,000 dogs in his lifetime. If you watch the classic Stude shorts, you'll notice a lot of screen time with Curly and dogs. It was actually in his contract with Columbia Pictures that he could bring dogs to set, although he was limited to two at a time. Shemp Howard had a lot of good qualities as a person, but he was a nervous individual in real life and had a lot of phobias. One of his many fears was of dogs. However, he did like his own dog, a collie named Wags. I also found this photo of Shemp with Petey, the dog from the R Gang Little Rascal shorts. Both of them are major icons of Hollywood's golden age, although you wouldn't expect the two to be seen together. Who else loved dogs? Harpo Marx of the Marx Brothers. Next to Groucho Marx, Harpo was the most identifiable, in appearance, of all the Marx Brothers. In the movies, he was mute. In real life, he talked a lot. Harpo had a lot of interesting quirks. Like Curly from the Three Stooges, Harpo really loved dogs. He kept a rest stop for stray dogs. There were four kennels, always with food available. Dogs on the go could stop by, hang out, get a bite to eat, then be on their way. When Harpo was a kid, he used to go to department stores just to ride the escalators. The things fascinated him. Harpo loved escalators so much that when he could afford it, he put them in his Hollywood home. Everyone who has seen Harpo knows him for wearing hats. It's not as common to know that he wore wigs. As a matter of fact, he wore two wigs when making a movie. One would shrink due to the heat from the lights and his own perspiration. Stay tuned for more fun with the Marx Brothers later in the video. Mary Boland She may not have the name recognition of some of the other stars in this video, but in her heyday, Mary Boland was a very active and popular character actress. She started her career on the stage. Her first stint in films ended in 1920. When Mary came back to films in 1931, she had made a name for herself as a stage comedian. Her second try at films was extremely successful, and she frequently starred with Charlie Ruggles, who was a major comedy actor in the 1930s. She was able to balance films with stage and even television. Naturally, with all this work comes lots of money. Mary Boland joins the ranks of Curly Howard and Harpo Marx as one of the world's greatest dog lovers. Her Pekingese pups had their very own bedroom. Each one had its own feathered bed. On the walls were framed pictures of their canine friends with paw print autographs. Sweet living! After becoming successful, Mary also took up sculpting. If you were to ask her, she would model you in clay at the slightest whim. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy It's not unusual for comedians to take really good care of their dogs. Edgar Bergen took it a step further. He actually provided for his famous dummy, Charlie McCarthy. Of course, they were big hits in films, television, and live performances. But how many ventriloquist acts can be super popular on radio? Edgar Bergen's radio show with Charlie McCarthy and his other puppets 
was so interesting and so fresh that it entertained audiences for years. You could forget that Charlie was a puppet and believe he was a real person. Since Edgar owed so much to Charlie for his success, it was natural that he wanted to take care of him. By the 1930s, Edgar had Charlie insured for an impressive $1,500 a week. At one point, Charlie McCarthy was even given his own Filipino valet. When Edgar died in 1978, he left Charlie McCarthy $10,000 in his will. Charlie now resides at the Smithsonian. Edgar and Charlie made their last appearance in the first Muppet movie. Bergen died shortly after filming his part. The Muppet movie was released in 1979 and became a huge hit. Spanky McFarland of the Little Rascals Guess who else was a dummy? Spanky! It's true, but it wasn't always that way. George Spanky McFarland was actually a very good child actor. He loved playing Spanky and celebrated it for the rest of his life. He was in 95 Our Gang, also known as the Little Rascals, shorts from 1932 to 1942. In his early appearances, Spanky was a toddler. He became such a breakout star that when he got a little older, he became the leader of the gang. From 1935 to 1940, Spanky's popularity was rivaled only by Alfalfa, but Spanky was still the boss. If you've ever watched The Little Rascals, you know that it's a large ensemble cast. There are moments when even the boss man has to stand around and not do anything, while others take the spotlight. Spanky got tired of being his own stand-in and complained about it to the studio. They came up with a solution pretty quick. Hal Roach Studios decided to make a wooden dummy of Spanky that they could use for those unimportant moments. It was even fully posable. Eddie Cantor If you think having a dummy made in your likeness is cool, how about a giant 50-foot tall parade balloon? That's exactly what happened to Eddie Cantor in the 1934 Macy's Day Thanksgiving Parade. It's extremely unusual for a real-life celebrity to have a balloon in the Macy's Day Parade. His balloon was the first to be based on a real person. It only appeared in the 1934 parade. As of 2022, Eddie Cantor is still the only real person to have his own full-size balloon. In 1935, Harpo Marx was given his own balloon, but it was only 15 feet tall. That, too, was a one-time appearance. In 2003, the main three Marx brothers, Groucho, Harpo, and Chico, became the first balloon heads of the Macy's Day Parade. Inflated balloon heads were actually worn on people who dressed in costumes. They appeared through 2006 before they were retired from the famous New York Parade. After that, the balloon heads were sent to Portland for the Macy's Holiday Parade that was hosted over there. The Marx Brothers balloon heads were seen at that event until 2013 when they were done for keeps. Macy's in the city of Portland, Oregon ended their relationship in early 2017, and allegedly the balloon heads were sent back to the parade studio. Will they ever return? It's hard to say, but it's extremely unlikely that they or Eddie Cantor will ever come back as full-size balloons. Why did Eddie Cantor's balloon appear only once? Who knows? Eddie Cantor remained extremely popular for the rest of his life, dying in 1964. One reason for his balloon being short-lived may be the fact that it had a defect. The left shoe was deflated. Also, it's been rumored that the balloon was pretty scary looking to children. So what happened to the balloon? Like a lot of other old Macy's Day balloons, the rubber was donated to the U.S. military during World War II. The military recycled the balloon and turned it into something else. There wasn't any medium Eddie Cantor didn't conquer. He was a major star of stage, screen, radio, and television. Eddie was big on Broadway for sure. He did everything from performing, to writing, to producing. Eddie gave a lot of famous people their big break, like George Burns and Gracie Allen. He had a distinctive look 
which earned him the nickname Banjo Eyes. He came a long way from the Lower East Side of New York City. Eddie's real name was Izzy Itzkowitz. Eventually, he gained a great reputation for his charity and humanitarian work. Eddie had five children, all of them girls. He always wanted a son, but never got one. Eddie wrote a lot of hit songs, too many to list. However, one that he co-wrote should be familiar to every person alive. Merrily We Roll Along, penned in 1935, became the Merry Melodies cartoon theme for Warner Brothers. If you've ever seen a Bugs Bunny cartoon, you'll know what I'm talking about. George Burns and Gracie Allen Out of all the real-life married couples in show business, my favorite will always be George Burns and Gracie Allen. They are a one-of-a-kind combination. George was fantastic in his slick, subtle humor. Gracie was absolutely the best at what she did. She was so good, in fact, that she has never been equaled for her talent. Gracie's character was wacky. What she said, the way she delivered it, it can best be described as genius stupidity. You have to be extremely smart to play someone who is so out of step with the rest of the world. People realize that, and she was always revered as something of a wonder kind. The duo had been on stage for quite a while before they made their first attempts on radio. Things weren't working out for them. Then... Gracie made a solo appearance on Eddie Cantor's radio show in 1931. Right after that show, they were both hired to do a guest spot on Rudy Valley's radio show. In just two weeks, Burns and Allen became radio stars. They had their very own radio show by 1933. Burns and Allen became so huge that they had big stars, like Eddie Cantor and Rudy Valley, appear on their own show. Burns and Allen were extremely visible and all over the place, but there was at least one thing about Gracie that a lot of people didn't know. Her eyes were different colors, one green and one blue. No one could see this on the radio, and later on their popular black and white television show, they both appeared gray. George Burns' real name was Nathan Birnbaum. Gracie's nickname for him was Natty. George's nickname for Gracie was Googie. Gracie had a lifelong crush on legendary comedian Charlie Chaplin. When she was a little girl, she got to meet Chaplin on her birthday. It was quite a visit. Chaplin had a cameraman take moving pictures of him and her waving at the camera. Gracie's film debut was with Charlie Chaplin. He also kissed her on the cheek. If this film footage still exists, please contact me. I would like to share it on this channel. If you've ever seen George Burns, you know he liked to smoke cigars. His habit is an argument for people who say smoking kills. George smoked 10 to 15 big cigars a day for his entire adult life and lived to be 100 years old. Charlie Chaplin Gracie Allen's lover boy he is one of the most recognizable film personalities of all time. When someone says Charlie Chaplin, they automatically think of his Little Tramp character. He wore a little mustache and a raggedy suit, complete with derby hat, cane, and a funny walk. If you have never seen a Charlie Chaplin movie, you've seen his image somewhere. That's the power of true celebrity. So much has been said about Charlie Chaplin, good and bad. He was always considered highbrow and cultured. However, he really liked only one painting, Vincent Van Gogh's Old Shoes. For some reason, Chaplin just thought that was a great picture. Ed Wynn Speaking of old shoes, guess who loved his own? Ed Wynn was a very popular comedian in his day. He started in vaudeville in 1903. He developed his perfect fool character that became his stage persona. In the early 1930s, he became a radio star and conquered the platform. He also did movies. In 1949, he became one of the first big TV stars. Ed Wynn had three series of his own through 1959. After that, 
He started doing dramatic roles and received praise, but he never totally ditched the comedy. Ed Wynn's worn-out old shoes that he wore in his movies and radio shows were so important to him that he kept them forever. By the 1930s, he had those shoes for well over 30 years. Instead of replacing them, he had spent over $1,000 in repairs. If you don't know Ed Wynn by his act or even by his appearance, his voice will be very familiar to you. He is probably the most imitated voice in all of cartoons. Many cartoon voice actors have imitated Ed Wynn's voice over the years. His voice is so funny and cartoony sounding that it's guaranteed to get laughs right away. If you don't believe me, just ask Captain Peter Peach Fuzz from Rocky and Bullwinkle, Fred the Lion from Super Chicken, Gandy Goose, King Candy from Wreck-It Ralph, Sidney the Elephant, Wally Gator, and a ton of other characters. You might be asking, well, what about the Mad Hatter from Disney's Alice in Wonderland? Ed Wynn himself did that voice. Jack Pearl Ed Wynn liked his old shoes. Jack Pearl liked his old tie. Jack Pearl was a popular comedian of stage and radio. He made a few movie appearances, but was best known for his radio work. He enjoyed a long career, but the 1930s was his heyday. Jack kept his first necktie that he ever wore in show business. He continued to wear it on his first nights and broadcasts. W.C. Fields Ah, uh, yes, my little chickadee. Like Ed Wynn, W.C. Fields was another comedian with an often imitated voice in many cartoons. The Merry Melodies Looney Tunes cartoons, in particular, liked impersonating Fields quite a bit. But he became a staple of funny cartoon voices as well as real comedians who liked copying him. Fields was quite a character in real life, with more interesting quirks than you could shake a stick at. Every night, before he went to bed, he wanted six fresh lemons on his table. Why? He wanted to practice his juggling. Another peculiar thing about W.C. Fields is his banking habits. He traveled a lot, and in every town he went to, he would go to a bank and start a new bank account under a false name. And he would put some money in it. But the problem with that was, is that he could never remember what town he went to, where he did his banking, and what name he used. So today, there are still a lot of bank accounts out there that he started under false names that have some money in them. The interest that these bank accounts have accrued must be huge. Joe Cook You don't know Joe Cook? Where have you been? If you were living in the 1920s to 1930s, people might have said that to you. Since that time, he is not widely remembered. Why? Mostly because he hated Hollywood. Joe Cook was a popular vaudeville performer. He was extremely talented and can do a lot of different things. Joe was good enough to headline at the Palace Theater in New York. He was also able to get into Broadway. After that, he got into radio. As far as Hollywood was concerned, he didn't have much use for it. He made two full-length movies and a handful of comedy shorts. That was it. He saw himself as more of a live performer than a film actor, and he was an East Coaster. In his time, he was a household name all over the country, but besides a small film presence, little evidence of his career has survived to present day. Sadly, Joe's career ended in 1941 when Parkinson's disease brought him down. Perhaps he would have changed his mind about making movies if he could have continued working. He lived until 1959. It's been speculated that if Joe Cook had stayed healthy, he would have been a perfect fit for television in its early days, when the wackiness of old vaudeville performers was embraced. It worked for Milton Berle. Joe seems like he was a fun guy in real life. His house in New Jersey was named Sleepless Hollow for the many parties he gave and celebrities he entertained. This was long, long before Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch. Sleepless Hollow was like an amusement park. 
he had an odd three-hole golf course. The last green was actually cone-shaped. No matter how you hit the ball, you would always get a hole-in-one. He also had a tree in his garden that was made to look like it grew green golf balls. Inside the house was just as goofy. The butler would be one of his show business buddies he picked up from vaudeville. Depending on when you showed up, the butler could be a contortionist, acrobat, midget, or just about anyone. When Joe was growing up, he could only afford the cheap clay marbles. Upon becoming rich, one of his hobbies was collecting the biggest, glossiest, agate marbles money could buy. Now that's a man who had all his marbles. Joe E. Brown Another good time Joe. Joe E. Brown had a very successful career. His real heyday was in the 1930s and 40s. After that, parts got smaller, but he still worked and he was still memorable. Joe had a friendly screen persona and his key feature was an enormous elastic mouth smile. You could call him a big mouth, but that's what made him money. If Joe wanted to quit movies, radio, and television, he had a lot to fall back on. Before his fame as a comedian, he was a professional baseball player as well as a circus clown and an acrobat. Baseball was one of his greatest passions. He made a lot of contributions to the sport and even did some announcing for it in the 1950s. Billy Gilbert Billy Gilbert is one of those comic actors you really have to be a film buff to know about. He actually enjoyed a very long career, but people remember him best as a bit player in Laurel and Hardy movies of the 1930s. Billy was a big guy who could play a lot of different types and do interesting things. When he first got into films, he did a sneezing act that lasted 15 minutes. This became one of his most popular routines for the rest of his life. He was actually discovered by Stan Laurel, who saw him perform. Stan thought Billy was so good that he talked to producer Hal Roach about him, and that was all it took. In the Laurel and Hardy movies, Billy Gilbert played any variety of goofy characters who were not the most masculine men around. One of the funniest bits is when Stan would respond to him with a, Yes, ma'am. Well, acting is acting, and nothing stopped Billy from finding an attractive wife named Ella McKenzie, who he married in 1938. He was married once before, but that didn't work out. Billy and Ella, who he called Lolly, just seemed to click. Charlie Chase, a major comedy star in the Golden Age, was the best man at their wedding. Laurel and Hardy I'm a huge, huge Laurel and Hardy fan. Literally, I'm very big and tall. Where I think Burns and Allen was the greatest husband and wife comedy team, Laurel and Hardy was clearly the best two-man comedy duo. Their timing and delivery can't be matched. Plus, it's easy to see that both of them put a lot of themselves into their work. They truly earned their fame and fortune, and you just can't say that about every Hollywood personality. There is so much to tell about Laurel and Hardy that it's hard to be selective. Laurel was the skinny one, Hardy was the fat one. However, in real life, Stan Laurel could easily put away more food than Hardy. The two were actually good friends and good co-workers, despite being very different people. They did not have a strained relationship like you see in some phony biopics and other tabloid type articles. Laurel and Hardy actually shared each other's hobbies in real life. Laurel liked fishing. Hardy liked golf and was extremely good at it. Although Laurel wasn't all that much into golf, he would play with Hardy. Hardy, who wasn't the greatest fan of fishing, would go fishing with Laurel. Oliver Hardy was quiet and reserved in real life. When the camera started rolling, he could instantly jump into his film character, surprising many of his co-stars. If you've ever seen a Laurel and Hardy movie, you know Hardy is the loud, forceful one who gets easily angered. Meanwhile, Stan Laurel, the guy who always got picked on, was the boss of the act. He decided what the team was going to do and had a hand in the writing and other behind-the-scenes aspects of filmmaking. 
Stan was anything but stupid in real life. Oliver was totally cool with Stan being the boss and very early on in their partnership requested to just be a performer. Hardy certainly wasn't lazy in this request because he always took a lot more physical abuse than Laurel. According to Stan, they never had disagreements about the act, ever. Joan Davis I can't say enough good things about Joan Davis. She is someone people should know more about today. Joan Davis is absolutely fantastic. With all due respect to Lucille Ball, of whom I'm also a fan, Joan Davis was the physical comedy queen. I've never seen another female comedian do what Joan Davis could do. She can move her body in so many different ways that it's sometimes hard to believe she's real. At one time, Joan Davis was the highest paid woman on radio. The money she made on radio allowed her to start her own production company. That's how she was able to produce her own TV series, I Married Joan. If you haven't seen I Married Joan, Watch anything you can find of it on the internet. Buy as many episodes on DVD as you can. This is worth your time. She's funny, and she has a good supporting cast. There's always at least one scene of over-the-top physical comedy, but much of it is just really good comedy writing. Joan's show ran for three seasons from 1952 to 1955. There's an ironic twist to her career. She actually got her start and became famous long before anyone knew about Lucille Ball. However, when Lucy hit it big with I Love Lucy in 1951, a number of similar shows were made to capitalize on that success. In the early 1950s, it was good to be a dumb woman. I Married Joan is considered an imitation of I Love Lucy. However, Joan Davis herself was in no way copying Lucy's style because she had it many years earlier. Joan Davis has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, one for movies and one for radio. However, most fans probably know her best for her TV show. Seems like an oversight to me. I think we should get together and petition for Joan Davis to get a star for television. Hugh Herbert Hugh Herbert was so big of a name and image in the 1930s and 40s. Sadly, He's one of those famous names who have become quite obscure over time. Why is this? He worked until his death in 1952. However, this was before television really hit its stride. If he had lived a little longer and got himself a TV show, he may have been quite successful with it and, therefore, more remembered today. Hugh got his start in vaudeville, but he used to play very serious roles on the stage. Over time, as talking pictures came into being, he developed his comedy persona. He would get flustered, flutter his fingers together, and say his famous catchphrase, Hoo hoo hoo! Wonderful, wonderful! Hoo hoo hoo! He was yet another famous comedian that cartoons liked to imitate. Looney Tunes cartoons, in particular, liked to do caricatures of Hugh Herbert. But it wasn't just cartoons that liked to copy Hugh Herbert. Comedians like Curly of the Three Stooges and Mickey Rooney, when he was playing Andy Hardy, liked to make the same noise. For some reason, however, they changed it to woo-woo-woo. Since that caught on so big with audiences, Herbert himself started saying woo-woo-woo in the 1940s. Hugh's screen character was a fun persona, and he also had a fun side in real life. At home, in his personal library, he had a big, oblong fish pond sunk in the floor. It's probably not a great idea to have a pool of water near so many books, but come on, fish pond. That's just cool. And last but not least, Victor Moore. Like Hugh Herbert, Victor Moore is another famous personality who has become obscure over time, but was extremely famous in his day. He was a major Broadway star, but he was best known for being a screen comic. His career in movies lasted a very long time, from 1915 to 1955. Victor played timid, mild-mannered roles and was famous for his wimpy voice. In 1945, 
Warner Brothers made a Daffy Duck cartoon called Ain't That Ducky. The featured antagonist was a caricature of Victor Moore. Victor loved what they were doing so much that he offered to do the voice of that character for free. Victor Moore was very well liked by his colleagues, and he got a lot of work. He may have been known for playing wimpy characters, but there was nothing wimpy about him in real life. His first wife had died after over 30 years of marriage. When Victor married his second wife, he was 65 years old, and she was 20. They remained married for 20 years until he passed away. In real life, Victor carried an umbrella with him everywhere, just about all the time. It was a funny quirk, but he didn't trust the weatherman. In the late 1930s, Victor's son Robert set a hunting record in California. Robert killed a 150-pound buck deer with just one shot from a 22 caliber pistol. Support your local comedian. The clown of today may be the star of tomorrow. All of the men and women we've looked at put a lot of effort into making themselves likable and watchable. They develop their screen personalities from their own personal experiences and funny quirks. If you can still be talked about after over a hundred years, you know you've done a good job. Until next time, keep it light.